Well, good morning. Let's, um, let's open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians. Uh, we're, we're, we're back into uh, our study of 2 Corinthians. We, we'll pick it up there in, in chapter 10. And um, Part of the reason why I wanted to take a break, not only because it was, it was Christmas and um, you know, I wanted to preach those messages, but I felt that chapter 10 went, was, a, was a very good message to, to preach on the dawn of a new year. Um, when we start thinking about the, you know, the year upcoming and, okay, you know, what, what it is that, you know, we, we want to do better this next year than what we did last year. You know, what direction do we want to see our lives go in? You know, what, what commitments do we want to make? You know, what, what are the things that we see God leading us into this next year? And, you know, we're, we're going to look, Paul, just basically, he's just giving a, a testimony of kind of his, of his life and his ministry and kind of what was going on. And we're just going to pull three things from that and we're going to apply that to, to our testimony as we look forward to, to 2018. Not just us as individuals, but even us as, as a church when we start thinking about the direction and vision, okay, where it is that, that we are as a church and where do we see God leading us as, as a church. Um, uh, my prayer is that these three things would kind of uh, be a springboard for us, if you will, um, as, as we move into 2018. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. I'm actually going to tackle the entire, uh, the entire chapter this morning, so, uh, so let's get into it. Let's stand as we honor the reading of God's Word this morning. 2 Corinthians 10, uh, beginning verse 1, the holy, perfect, inerrant Word of God says this. Now I, Paul, myself urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold towards you when absent. I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. You are looking at things as they are outwardly. If anyone is confident in himself, that is, he is Christ's, let him consider this again within himself, that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast somewhat further about our authority, which the Lord gave for, the building, um, for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be put to shame. For I do not wish to seem as if I would terrify you by my letters." For they say, his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters when absent, such persons we are also indeed when present. For we are not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves. But when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are without understanding. But we will not boast beyond our measure, but within the measure of the sphere which God apportioned to us as a measure to reach even as far as you. For we are not overextending ourselves as if we do not reach to you. For we were the first ones to come even as far as you in the gospel of Christ, not boasting beyond our measure, that is, in other men's labors, but with the hope that as your faith grows, we will be within our sphere enlarged even more by you, so as to preach the gospel even to the regions beyond you, and not to boast in what has been accomplished in the sphere of another, but he who boasts is to boast in the Lord. For it is not he who commends himself that is approved, but he whom the Lord commends. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that, uh, Lord, that you would just encourage us this morning. Lord, I know that um, whether we, we verbally say it or not, whether 
we, we make these you know, resolutions. The, the New Year is always a, a time for reflection. As we look back, but it's also a time for a new beginning. As we move forward. Lord, I pray that we can take this testimony of, of Paul and his ministry. Lord, we can make application into our life and our church and the ministry that, that goes on here. Lord, I pray that in 2018 that we can be more faithful with the gospel than what we were in 2017. Lord, I, I pray that in 2018 we can go and, and to more places, reach more people. Become a greater witness for you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be faithful in the sphere that, that you've given us. Let, let us not look to, to others. But Lord, let's, let's take care of what it is that you've entrusted us with. Lord, I, I thank you for... Lord, this time of worship, even the worship through the preaching of your word, may it be pleasing in your sight. Lord, may you be glorified. Not just in this moment, but Lord, moving forward, may we seek to bring glory and honor to the name of our Lord and Savior each and every day, each and every month, each and every year. Lord, we love you. And we lift up all these things in the most precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I have three words that I want to challenge us with moving into this next year. The first word is, is boldness. Boldness. I, I think there's, a, you know, there's, a, there's an area of our life that I think that we all, you know, no matter how bold we, we, we find ourselves or how much boldness we find lacking in ourselves, we, we should all have a desire to have more, more boldness or at least to, to want to be able to exercise boldness when it comes to our relationship with Christ. More boldness when it, when it comes to um, evangelizing for Christ. More boldness when it comes to making disciples for the name of Christ. You know what? Boldness is, is only one of those words. Um, I looked down and I realized I wrote down the wrong word. You know what the word that I wanted there? It's balance. Because we're going to balance boldness with something else. Let, let's just read verses 1 and 2. Now I, Paul, myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold towards you when absent. I ask that when I am present, I need to be bold with, with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we have walked according to the flesh. So we need to have a balance, yes, between boldness and meekness or gentleness as the Apostle Paul here. One of the things that, that Paul's addressing is that, you know, there are those again, remember we got to go back to our knowledge of what we've, you know, looked at the first nine chapters of, of 2 Corinthians. Re remember that there were some within the church that were trying to discredit Paul by, by any means necessary. They were trying to discredit him personally. They were trying to discredit his ministry. Here they were trying to discredit, you know, the letters that he had written to the Corinthians. And they said, something doesn't make sense here. Because how he's writing to us is, is very bold in nature, but Paul, when he is present with us, is actually very meek. See, Paul's desire was that the boldness of his letter would bring about repentance in Corinth so that when he arrived in person, he could treat them with, with gentleness. That was his desire. He says, I am meek when face to face with you, but bold towards you when absent. There, there is this balance that I think that sometimes we, we need to, to find and we need to strike. That yes, there are times that we do need to be bold. We need to you know, be out there. We, we need to have that boldness. We also need to have gentleness that goes along 
with that. I think both approaches are needed. Both approaches are necessary. And it's up to us to kind of find that balance. Obviously, we need to be bold in our conviction of truth. And yet gentle when we apply it. We seek after balance. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. Here the Lord is instructing the children of Israel, but this instruction carries over and on to, to all the, the, the children of God because what accompanies this instruction does not change. God says, be strong and courageous. You know, I, I, another way that we can say that, some other translations say, be, be strong and bold. Um, be bold and courageous. Be strong and courageous. In other words, have this, this boldness and God gives us a reason. He says, be strong and courageous and do not be afraid or tremble at them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you and he will not fail you or forsake you. The, the reason that we are to be bold is, is because that, that God goes forth. God is, is with us. God will never lead us. God will never leave us. Man, I'm glad this is the last last day of this year. We can just we need to strike this message from the record and um, erase this tape and just go back. Um, God says, "Be bold," because I'm I'm with you. And if the, the, the presence of God is with us, and if the Word of God is, is convicting us and moving us, then absolutely yes, we need to be bold in those things. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. Here Paul is asking the church at Ephesus to, to pray for him. He says, And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. So here God is telling the children of Israel, Be strong and courageous. Be bold because I am with you. Here Paul is praying and asking the church. He says, You know, pray that I will have boldness when I go and I speak the utterances of the mystery of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. We need boldness. But look in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you, to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And, and I think sometimes that's the, the balance that we kind of we, we kind of find it hard to, to, to really strike up. We're either one or the other. It's like we're, we're, we're gentle and meek, but we're not bold to say anything. Or we're bold to say anything and we don't do it with gentleness or with reverence. And we need to have that balance. We need to be bold in our conviction. We need to be bold to speak the truth of God. But we also need to be gentle. With people, you know, I've said it before. I've, I've seen people take the you know the truth of God's word and just beat people over the head with it. We need to take that truth of, of God's word and deliver it in a, in a loving way, in a caring way. You know the uh, you, you go through Jesus's ministry in the Gospels. You know the the only really the only people that that he was less than gentle with were the religious people. Sinners, lost people, he was so gentle, so kind. Now, he didn't water down his words. He still spoke the truth in, in boldness, but he, but he did it in a way that, that it drew people to, to what he had to say because how he treated them. I think that is the thing that we have to remember. We need to be drawing people towards what we have to say by how we treat them. 
we need balance. We need to be bold. And we need to be gentle. Paul says, you know, when I'm writing, I'm, I'm, it's bold because it is this truth. But he says, I'm also meek. I'm also gentle. The second word that I see that I want us to grab a hold of as we move into 2018 is the word battle. Verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Even though Paul was battling against human flesh, again, remember, it was people in the church who, who, for whatever reason, out of jealousy or out of envy or just wanting to stir up strife, were, were saying these things against the Apostle Paul. He says, you know what? E even, though, even though I'm battling against human flesh, he recognized that the battle itself was not a fleshly one, but a spiritual one. And, and I think that as, as we move into 2018, uh, we recognize that we are constantly in a battle. We, we are constantly in a spiritual battle. It, we, you know, we, we have been for a while, and I don't expect that to ease up because we're turning to New Year. As a matter of fact, I expect that to actually get rougher, and, but it's recognition that even though it may be people saying things, even though it may be people doing things, ultimately the battle is a spiritual one. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Our battle is a spiritual one. And as we prepare for 2018, we need to be ready for this battle. Because anywhere that we are out taking ground from Satan, he will fight back. Every time. You know, I kind of, I use that to encourage people um, in, the, in the midst of, of this spiritual battle. And, you know, we, we faced a number of them this past year. And again, like I said, you know, I, I think that it, those things are going to continue. Because as long as, as we are out there sharing the gospel, as long as we are pushing back the darkness and we are reclaiming darkness for the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be a spiritual battle. But one of the marks that I say is, hey, don't. Don't be discouraged by it. Be encouraged by it. Because if we weren't doing those things, Satan wouldn't be attacking. If we were just worried about ourselves and what we liked and, you know, kind of had that country club feel, well, we'll just do what we like. And, you know, we're not out there, you know, trying to reach people for, for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not out there taking the Gospels to, to the uttermost ends of the earth. If we weren't doing those things, then there would be no battle. But as long as we continue to fight that fight, we need to be ready for the spiritual battle. Paul goes on, verse 4. He says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Our battle is a spiritual one, but so are our weapons. We always have to remember that. I think so often we try to fight a spiritual battle in the flesh and we lose that battle each and every time. But Paul says our battle is spiritual, but the weapons that we have are, are spiritual as well. He says not only are they spiritual, but they are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. These spiritual weapons have been given to us by God. Again, look at Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 10 and 11, and then verse 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His mind. Again, the weapons are they are divinely given. They are divinely powerful. They're God's weapons. He just allows us to use them. So Paul, again, is reminding us to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. And put on the full armor of God, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. 
Verse 13, he says, Therefore take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Battle. 2018 will be a year of spiritual battles. It will be a year for us to take up the full armor of God. It will be a year for us to stand firm in the convictions that we have of the truth. The conviction that God has, has given us to go and to spread that truth. Back in 2 Corinthians, verses 5 and 6. He says, We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. See, it's not just knowing that we're in a battle. It's not just, just knowing that God has given us these spiritual weapons, this, this armor of God that we have to, to go in and fight this battle. It's a, it's a willingness to take the fight to our enemy. That's what Paul's talking about here. They're not just sitting back saying, okay, we're just going to be ready when Satan attacks. But it's taking the fight to him. He says, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. A anything, wh wh whether they're speculations or whether they you know, was pride or you know, anything that has been raised up against the knowledge of God. Paul says, we're not standing for it. We are seeking it and we are destroying it. He says, we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Not just actions, but, but thoughts. And I... And I I think that fight begins with ourselves. That fight begins with us. So when we talk about you know, the battle, we've we got to fight our own spiritual battle that is within ourselves. But also, taking it to the outside. 2018, we must be willing to keep our foot down. And to continue to take the fight where it's needed most. That willingness to take the gospel and the love of Jesus to the, to the front lines. We continue to, to do that. We're going to be in a battle. A battle to which God has prepared us. A battle to which Jesus will lead us. I think that is the most comforting thing in the knowledge of is this idea, okay, I'm in a spiritual battle against something that I can't see. I'm in a spiritual battle against, you know, something that, that maybe I don't even fully understand. It can kind of be scary. But when we know that it's Jesus who's leading us, we're simply following our commander into battle. Look in Revelation chapter 19. I, I, this is the picture of obviously not Jesus leading. He's leading in a, in a real battle, but it's, it's the same Jesus that leads us into spiritual battles as well. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse... And he who sat on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. And he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We always have to remember that that's who we're following in the battle. We are following the King of Kings and the Lord 
of lords. We are following the Lamb of God who strikes down the nations and who rules them with a rod of iron and who treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. You know, I think one of the, uh, one of the biggest lies that Satan tries to get us to believe is that he is one. That somehow we, we, are, we are defeated. Jesus stands victorious. We are not defeated. But we are victorious. Our testimony in 2018, may it be balance. It's going to be a battle. Thirdly, let it be boasting. We begin there in verse 7. And, um, through the rest of the chapter, Paul begins talking about, about boasting. And there's, there's really two types of, of boasting. Um, there's boasting on ourselves, which is fruitless and sinful. And there's boasting on God. Obviously, Paul's talking about the latter. Anything that he boasts, he is boasting about what, what, what God is doing through him. No, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't deny that God was using him. You know, I think there's that, that false humility where we act like, oh, God can't use me for anything. I'm just a nobody. And then, that's not what he's saying. He says, God used him. You know what? God wants to use each and every one of us. But when God uses us, we, we need to brag on God. There's, I think sometimes we get away from that. We get away from just being with other Christians and just bragging on God. Hey, this is what God is doing in our lives. This is what God is doing in our church. We, you know, Satan always wants us to look at the negative. And, and we can, that, that really kind of, it can eat away at a church real quick. We can real quickly get into, okay, this is what we're not doing and this is what's not going on. And we can forget about all the things that God is doing. But we need to remind ourselves. We need to remind each other, hey, God is worthy to be bragged on. Verses 7 through 11. He says, you are looking at the things as they are outwardly. How guilty are we that? Are we of that? We look at external things. You are looking at things as they are outwardly. If anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ's, let him consider this again within himself, that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. Our boasting, it begins that, that we belong to Jesus. Verse 8, he says, For even if I boast somewhat further about our authority, which the Lord gave for the building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be put to shame, for I do not wish to seem as if I would terrify you by my letters. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, and his personal presence is unimpressive, and his speech contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters when absent, such persons we are also indeed when present." Our boasting is not displayed in physical things. Like numbers. And we can get wrapped up in numbers real quick. Um, you know, especially being, being Southern Baptists. Um, as Southern Baptists, we, we put a number on everything. Like everything that we do, it's like we, we put a number on it. Then we can get wrapped up in that. Numbers tell us some things, but numbers don't tell us everything. It's an external. Our boasting shouldn't be in physical things. But in inward things like salvation, obedience, spiritual growth. When, when, when's the last time that, that we bragged about you know, the, the obedience of ourselves or the obedience of someone else? When is the last time that, that we bragged that someone, they overcame a, a, a sin in their life? 
When's the last time that, that we bragged that we led someone to the Lord or that we experienced someone getting saved or we saw someone being baptized? When's the last time we bragged because we saw someone growing spiritually? Paul says when it, when it comes to, to, to boasting about ministry and, and the things that are happening, the things that we are doing, he says don't get caught up in looking at externals. Because things can look externally impressive and be spiritually shallow. I've used this illustration before, but um, and this truth, it just sticks with me so much. Uh, Bill Hybels, a pastor at Willow Creek Church in, uh, by Chicago one point was one of the largest Protestant churches in in the United States. I don't, I don't think they are anymore, but they were late 90s, early 2000s. They did a survey of their church, spiritual survey, because they were growing. They were huge, just, I mean, large. He says, I, I kind of want to take a spiritual temperature of their church, and they did a survey. And he wrote a book about it. And in that book he wrote, he says, Our church is a mile wide, but it's only an inch deep. Externals don't, don't tell the whole picture. Paul says, if you're going to brag on something, don't brag that your church is a mile wide. Brag how deep your church is. See, Paul was given words of authority to build up the body, not tear it down. We are, we are to build up the body spiritually. It's my job as your pastor. Take the church deeper. Deeper into the Word of God. Deeper into our relationship with Christ. Deeper into to our service. It's God's job to grow it numerically. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verses 22 and 23. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I might by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. I, I, I love that mentality that the Apostle Paul had, but notice what he's not saying. He does not say, I became all things to all men so that I could have a big church. Not what he said. He doesn't say, I became all things to all men so I can get larger offerings on Sunday. He says, I become all things to all men so that he could see some saved. Spiritual boasting. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets 